Hello. Today, uh, we're here with uh, Lisa Reynolds, who is a book designer and an assistant professor at Wilkes University, uh, where she teaches graphic design and um, what, are, what else? Uh, Lisa, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, I teach mainly foundational graphic design at, at Wilkes in our program. We have, we're a multimedia design program, so we have a lot of students who do motion design and 3D, 3D rendering and things like that. We also have graphic designers as well. So I find myself mostly in foundational design pr practices and things like idea generation, that kind of stuff. Wow. Um, well, <laughs> you know, we've had a, a fairly long term and very uh, constructive relationship with, with yeah. Lisa in a variety of, of areas. I mean, she's done work for us, Eddie Trotskin. She's uh, designed several of my books, one for Broadstone uh, books and one for the University of Tennessee. So you've worked in a lot of different yeah. environments. I actually just finished too. I actually just finished designing and illustrating a children's book for, um, yeah. <laughs> wow. It was an exciting one, yeah. So the, the Northeast Pennsylvania Philharmonic puts out a, a small children's book every every season. Um, and it's usually sort of related to what their season's gonna be about. And the executive director uh, approached me and asked me to do it. And it was on, um, it was on Tchaikovsky's, um, the fantasy suite, uh, the Romeo and Juliet uh, you know, overture. And sort of comparing and contrasting it to, to Leonard Bernstein's uh, West Side Story. So it was a great opportunity for illustration and design for the whole book. So that was a very different experience um, than the work that I do for, for Etruscan and, and for you, Phil. But still, love, I, I'm moving into new, new dimensions of publishing. So, wow. so the children's book, you're doing an internal design also. Yeah, so that be, I mean, because it's a it's a children's book, it's it's geared towards younger readers. It's a picture book, so every page has some level of either illustration or, you know, design involved in it. So it's it's a very different uh, structure, obviously, than than what we're dealing with up here at the at the at the adult level. Um, but you know, I I think that it's similar in here. I'll, let me back. Let me jump back. <laughs> jump back. <laughs> One of my favorite things about book design and, and, and doing this kind of work is that it is distilled creative concept. It is base level just, okay, what feeling or what message are we trying to accomplish and what can we make it look like to do so? Um, and because so many of the books that I've worked on for Etruscan have been either collections or poetry, you don't necessarily have a very specific story or visual device to draw on in the way you would um, like a novel or something that has, you know, if you have a detective novel, there's visual aspects of, of things that you can play into. Um, but because of the nature of the books that I've done for, for Etruscan, it's very much been, you know, key in on one specific sort of emotional response that the book is manifesting. Um, and and try to sort of abstractly visually manifest that. So that's that's so so that's how it's been a huge difference too, because the content for the children's books significantly more literal. Like I did a literal actual mm -hmm. illustration of Leonard Bernstein because it lent itself to one of the spreads. Um, so you know that experience of of being able to be a little bit more literal has has been diff very different, but fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Right, and in fact, that I think you've described it beautifully to say that. Uh, because poetry books, in a sense, have air in between the poems. Mm -hmm. There's not there's not a narrative line, and there's not something that's specifically visual. Right. You get to make up this emotionally charged yeah. image that it is so fun. could be anything. And and mm -hmm. I know that one of the things that I'm uh, most thrilled by and I enjoy the most is the various versions which oftentimes are very different from one another. Right. People think, oh, well, that was the cover, that's the cover. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 you're gonna show no. us today. Yeah, that is, that is by design. I am very, it's, it's very important to me. And this doesn't just mean in the work that I do in publishing, this is all the design I do. I'm giving people options. That's my first window into what their aesthetic sense is and what their taste is. And books particularly, but everything I do, I constantly am reminding myself, this is not my book. This hmm. is not my book. If it were my book, it would look a certain <laughs> way because it's right. mine. 
yes. but it's not. Right. <laughs> and and every every iteration, every version, everything I send gives me more the, the feedback that I get based off of that or the choices that 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 authors make or that the marketing people make. They tell me a lot of information. They tell me what I should sort of be doing, where I should sort of be going. Um, so that process, that iterative process is super important. It's super, super important. So when I give people their first round of options, I want it to be as diverse as possible because it gives me information. Do you prefer serif or sans serif typefaces? Do you prefer illust illustration or photography? Do you, you know, do you prefer a, you know, a sort of more even hierarchical relationship between the title and the author name, or do you want to see some more, you know, hierarchy between those two aspects? Um, that's all stuff that I don't know because I don't know you, or not right. you specifically, but the author. I don't know you, and I didn't read your whole book. Um, but, and it's and it's your book. <laughs> it came from your brain and not mine. Um, so I'm just trying to honor it. I'm just trying to translate it for you on your behalf. Ultimately, it's, it's your material. I'm just trying to make someone see it with their eyes. Right. Um, so let me grab in. I'm going to, I'm going to grab the screen. Um, and let's take a look at what I mean by some of that stuff. But let me quickly make a full screen here. So you're not seeing all the other detritus that I have on my, <laughs> on my screen today, because it is quite a day here. Um, so I think, you know, I want to jump backwards. Right, right, right. I want to go up to Silk Road. Um, cause Silk Road was the first one that I did. Okay. Um, and my approach on this one, you know, obviously there were images provided by, uh, by Etruscan and by the author, um, that they felt strongly about that they really, really liked. So I, I, for this particular one, I worked in those images. I worked very much in that space of the images that were provided. Um, so what I wanted to do, this, this book was uh, a collection of poems written in the, per, uh, the persona of D Donata Polo. So it sort of tracks their travels and their, and their, you know, the adventures and all of the sort of interesting things that are happening um, with the, within those activities. So, you know, I really wanted it to be integrated into the atmosphere. I really thought it was important because we're telling the, the story uh, in the context of travels, in the context of this, you know, journey, um, I really wanted there to be some level of interaction with the images and with the text, because it's not necessarily just about her or her experience. It's about her experience related to a place or related to a thing. Um, so I wanted to relate those two items visually. And I did that in a couple of different ways. Um, as you can see, the first sample up here this one dealt a little bit more with the idea of revealing things. So things being partially hidden and then also sort of, you know, revealed under the surface and how, you know, when we admire someone or when we're interested in someone, we sort of choose what to believe and not to believe um, or what to, what to value and what not to value. Um, but the, the eventual cover that was chosen is this big one here. And this one, you know, it looks a little bit more on the subtle side. The interaction isn't quite as obvious as it is uh, on, on the first version on the left. But if you look really carefully, you can see that there are elements of the painting where the typography is sitting inside of it. So there are elements of the painting that are coming in front of the type and there, there are portions of it that are sort of behind. Um, and that is to sort of ground that, ti that title into the image. It inextricably links those two things. Um, and because this, but this this painting is so so colorful and so so evocative of I think what the subject matter was sort of trying to get at um, letting that painting just be the full flood of the cover and really sing it's beautiful color it's 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 a lot of intricacy there's a lot going on um, so sort of in integrating that intricate typography inside the the painting was was strategically how I wanted to translate that. And of course, as an added bonus, at least you recall it, uh, we were we were delighted. I was personally delighted that uh, <laughs> you guys chose uh, the cover that you chose because this other painting, this painting over here on the left, um, guy, which yeah. was was absolutely enthralling to me, and we wound up using that on my book, Phantom Signs, which you designed. We did. Yeah. So, now I don't have Phantom Signs here. Um, just because, you know, we, we were yeah. seeing a good portion right, of, of right. what I made for it for this. Um, it, but, and I do that pretty frequently, actually. I mean, there is repurposed covers a lot for a lot of different things. Right. 
Right. Well, we um, and we we've done that too. You know, taking versions and then saying, yeah. "Hey, wait a minute, not for this book, but this is a really nice. I'm yeah. gonna do it elsewhere." So that's cool. Because, that's one yeah. of the advantage of having these oper- these different versions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it helps me too because you're so the cover that I just did for you for the elsewhere. Um, sorry if I just spoiled something. <laughs> no, no. <that's, laughs> just, the cover that I just did for you for yeah. for your for, for your Brustow book. Um, that typography wasn't for another book, but I had done that typography as an option for a, a, a conference on race relations that huh. I did. I, yeah, so I did this logo, it was called the Light of Truth Conference, and I did these two options for the logo, one of them using that sort of linear typography that I created, and another one was the, the, the one that was actually chosen. So I was so in love with that initial that version <laughs> of typography. I was actually really disappointed that they didn't choose that logo. Um, you know, I, when I, when I looked at your, your work and the work that we were doing for you, it, it made a lot of sense and it right. fit in really, really well. Yes. So even repurposing elements happens quite a bit. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So the next guy I have, this is model and Dob, And I, I, I put this one in because I think this best illustrates that sort of diverse ray of covers that you had mentioned. Um, I have a photograph, I have two photographic ones and I have two illustrated ones here as the initial options, which are over here on the left. Um, and for this one, again, it's a collection of short stories. You know, the whole, the whole idea of it is that it kind of runs the gamut between, you know, humor and sympathy and, and, and you know, failure and success and all these really strong emotions. Um, and when I was reading the summary, it, the, 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 the idea of failure and the idea of adversity sort of kept popping up in the, in the language and what they were talking about. So when I thought about that, and especially in relation to the title, Waddle and Dob um, is a building method. It's a, it's a method of making walls, typically used in Ireland um, and the UK, typically, you know, mud and slats and hay, and they're applied in, you know, various wooden slats, so they're applied in various combinations to, you know, create the wall. So that was, so this one here is my literal interpretation of that actual process of waddle and dab, like that's the mud, that's the clay. And then this one, which eventually, with some modification, as you can see, ended up being the actual cover, was the figurative interpretation of that concept of the weaving in and out of the wooden slats and the letters kind of creating that strength and taking those, taking those lines and, and making them structurally sound. Um, the other two covers, the photographic one and the orange illustrated one, were more about sort of the path of self-discovery and that idea of failure and confusion and sort of feeling a little bit lost and feeling a little bit um, you know, untethered, I guess. Um, and, and, you know, simply the top one is, is simply a crumpled up manuscript. You know what I mean? It's a crumpled up piece of paper. It's just something where someone tried to write and just did not work out. Um, <laughs> so, which is you know, funny because you see it in the first impression, you know, is it a baby's clothing? Is it a dinosaur or is it no, bones? And, and you know, you have paper. to look at it closer to see what it is. Yeah. So. And I literally wrote, like I wrote that language. I crumpled up the paper and I threw it on the floor <laughs> of my living room. That is my, <laughs> took a picture right. of it. There we um, are. And then, you know, the bottom right one is just sort of the idea of like, reinforcing those angles, sort of making it seem as though it's dimensional, like a road or a path or something like that, that can be followed or can be sort of modified. Um, and I think, you know, this gave me a really good impression because Brian, this particular author, he gave very little direction. He was just sort of like, I kind of want to see what you can come up with. Right. And while that's extremely freeing and I love when that happens, it's also terrifying when that happens mm-hmm. because I have zero starting point. I'm just like, right, okay, exactly. does, what does he like? What's his, what's, what is his style? What is his aesthetic? Um, so, you know, giving more covers obviously was necessary for this one. That was really important. Right. And in fact, I remember the conversation that we had with Brian and he was in Ireland, so we hadn't met him. Okay. Uh, and one of the things he said, which I thought was interesting, he said uh, he, he preferred it, something that didn't have an image because he felt that an image might date the book. Mm-hmm. And I had I never just, heard yeah. that before. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, that's very interesting. So, uh, you know, that was the only input that I recall 
And, it's and definitely what we think through, um, especially when it comes to any publication, not even just a, like a book, you know, actual book publication is, you know, hair and clothes will they'll get you every time. You right. know what I mean? Right. They, right. they, those, those human representations or those, those things like that, like, and especially if you're, if you're somebody who follows trends and styles in design, you know, I mean, Rodrigo Corral from Ferrara Strauss and Giro is one of my favorite book designers working right now. He's incredible. He does amazing work. He's did all the Chuck Palahniuk books. Um, he did. He does he did Jay Z's book. I mean, they're just incredible work that he does. But there are times when it starts to become a little homogenous, and it starts to become. I can tell that it's one of his books. I can tell that it's one of his covers. Um, and that's just the way some designers work. I do not. I, I don't know that I would ha say I have a, a trackable style or a discernible style, at least when I'm doing commercial work, because again, it's not my work. It's yours. It's your book. It's not mine. <laughs> well, and, you know, the, the, that's, that's an, I mean, in some ways, of course, it's not your book. In other ways, you're the only person who speaks this vocabulary. And so, in yeah. a sense, we we say we come to you and we say, right. you know, uh, tell us, tell us. And then, of course, it, it's not the author, yeah. you know, may have a preference, but the publisher's sitting there too. And sure. the publisher has, has, they have their own agenda. Mm -hmm. Well, we have our own agenda when I'm the publisher. And so, it's really nobody has full ownership. Right. You know, every it's a it's a relationship among all of us. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So this one, okay, so this one went on a bit of a journey. Um, and I included, <laughs> there are two in here that went on quite a journey. Yes. Um, but this was another one where I don't know that initially the author felt really, really strongly about how she wanted the cover to look. They had sent along a couple of images and those are reflected in the two covers on the bottom um, that were nice. They were, they were perfectly good images, but they weren't really inspiring a whole lot for me. They weren't really, you know, giving me sort of any feelings or, or directions in any way. Um, and because this book was, had a lot to do with motherhood and, um, you know, I obviously, I'm a, I'm a mother, I have a, a, an eight year old son. Um, I just really tried to translate it based off of my conflicting feelings about, you know, early motherhood and, and, and when you first have a baby and how, you know, challenging that can be and how confusing and how, how, how so strong of a, of a, of a pull that is. Um, so those top three covers were really just my interpretations of how I sort of felt about, you know, motherhood related to work or motherhood related to, you know, how it interrupts your life, right? How it, how it sort of changes everything and sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a bad way. Um, and then also motherhood, how it can sort of make you feel less significant or smaller or kind of less yourself. Um, so those were sort of the themes that I was focusing on on the top top um, options, and then, like I said, you know, I, I did some typography work and some aesthetically visually pleasing work on the on the images below. Um, but I guess in the intervening time, the author had seen this photograph at a gallery and just fell in love with it and absolutely wanted to use it. The caveat was, though, the artist, the photographer. Uh, requested that we do not modify the photo in any way. So no cropping, no, no changing the color, no, no typography laying on top of it. Like they wanted the photo to exist in its integrity, you know, it's in, in, its, inter, in its original form, you know, full integrity intact. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a harder ask than I think they probably realized. <laughs> So we went through a second round then of designs, which you're seeing over here on the left, um, that were just different ways to kind of leverage that image and not touch it, but still do something with it, still sort of create some sort of interaction with it. And the, the, the right-hand side, I think, is what we ended up with, which I think is the most successful of all of the, of the options. That was um, a struggle, one, wasn't it? Yeah, I that was, that was a journey. Yeah. <laughs> journey um but you know i think we got there i think the 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 difference with the one i think that we ended up with versus the options that were presented is the hierarchy here this is focused on the image and the title of the book right. all of this white space all of this negative space and people discount white as a cover far too frequently huh. because when they're when you're designing or when you're looking at your computer or your interface it's white on white right like your your workspace is white the background is white everything sort of has that quality to it 
but you never see a book against a white background, huh. like ever, right. <laughs> unless it's laying on your white table. Right. Um, so to, to get that sort of emphasis on the title without doing anything to it, without touching it in any way, we gave all this white space around it to actively sort of push in on the title. So we really shifted the hierarchy on this one and, and made it made the photo and the title the thing that really sings and the thing that is impacts you the first. And looks almost three dimensional because of that white space. Yeah, yeah. And it, because when you do when, the when, the way I sort of um, put the type lined right on top of the photo. What that does is that makes your brain focus more on the negative space between the letters as opposed to the letters themselves. It shifts your perception. Yeah. So that's sort of where you're getting that 3D feel to it. It's, it's that white space and then unifying with the top part and then the, the dark space, you know, the positive space unifying with the bottom part. Ooh, 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 ooh we're jumping ahead. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's what sort of creates that level of, of unification, but also that sort of feel for 3D. Right. Right. Wow. <laughs> that's that's um, where the vocabulary comes in. I, I, I might have, you know, I, 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 it's like Alexander Pope, you know, says poetry is what, what oft was thought, but ne'er so well expressed. I mean, I may have had some of the, the yeah. fragments of those thoughts, but I could, never mm -hmm. could have said it like that. <laughs> never. Well, that's, you know, that's a big part of what we do in, in design education is we're not necessarily telling students to appreciate things that they see. We're telling them why they appreciate what right. they see. So when I take students to look at art, the first thing they say, art of any kind, design, fine art, anything, the first thing they say is, I like it. And you're like, okay, that's great what do you like about it or right. why do you like it and that's where their their communication breaks down that's where they're not always necessarily able to articulate that right. um so what we do is tell them not that they like it but we tell them why they like it what right. is it about this that's appealing to you well in all likelihood it's this 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 and this right. um and that's sort of our way of we, we don't people think we influence our students aesthetics and their aesthetic choices and it couldn't be further from the truth hmm. um, we really just help them translate it we help them understand it right wow <laughs> it's exciting because i'm yeah. so fun <laughs> but i love how we're transitioning from like this one this very sort of monochromatic gray mm -hmm. black and white situation to like the explosion right, of color right, that right, is right. the dear z um cover and this one this one was the first one where I was really disappointed in the, in the choice. <laughs> and I don't say that because I don't like the cover that, that they ended up choosing. I, I made it. So of course I think it's, it's successful. Um, but the, the other two that we're seeing over here on the top, these are actually, and I wish I could zoom in. I don't think I can in full screen, but those mandalas and those patterns are actually composed of tiny little illustrations of zygotes. So, <laughs> so wow. I did a little sort of conceptual illustration of a zygote, which is really just a circle with a smaller proportional circle inside of it, and then took that circle, changed the size, repeated it, you know, put it in this sort of pattern mandala style, and that's what that's where these two um, top covers came from. So I just I I just thought that was such a fun way to translate it and a fun way to go at it. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we don't we don't get what well, sometimes I don't get what I want, and that's all right. Um, but the other thing that's I think important to note about this one is again there were a few paintings, a few images that were provided to me, um, either by the publisher or the artist, and I never want to just take an image and plop it on a cover and plop type on top of it. I think that's doing a disservice to the book. Um, and a do a service to the art as well. That art was created to be seen and viewed in a certain way. And it's important to me that if I'm going to change the way that art is perceived, or if I'm gonna change the way that painting is viewed, I'm gonna do it in such a way that serves the message or serves the design and not just to have it be sitting there as color or as eye candy. Um, so when I was integrating, for instance, this bottom left one with the, with the two that had like the gigantic Z on them, um, I was really using that as a visual mechanism to try to lead you through the piece of art and try to have the, the translucent areas not covering the significant areas of the piece. 
Um, same thing sort of over on the one that we ended up choosing. Um, you know, you can obviously see there are certain areas of the painting that are more detailed or have more sort of information or, or perceptive messaging attached to them. Um, and it was really important that the typography and all of the other stuff avoided those areas and or, or enhanced those areas. Um, because this is essentially a retranslation of this artwork on my part. And mm -hmm. that's a big responsibility. I don't want to ruin the integrity or the intent of the original piece. Rather, I'd prefer to see it changed significantly to suit our purposes so that it's not being perceived in, does that make sense? It's kind of silly. Oh, yeah. Guys. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, we talk about the triangle of the designer, the uh, author and the publisher, but there's also the artist. You know, that, that per, and, and as you saw with Museum of Stone, sometimes the artists can, you know, may insist that the art, sure. that the art be used in a certain way. We've had yeah. that happen a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So here, I mean, to me, I, I love the, the, the idea of enhancing art yeah. by, you know, with this, placing it into another context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and I think a lot of the artists are delighted. You know, by that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I gotta say, every time I send off one of these covers where I have modified the, the original art significantly, I am really nervous to hear that <laughs> and see if, <laughs> if they're right, right, right. upset about it or not. Um, and everyone's been pretty gracious, so I've been very fortunate. But yeah, yeah it's important. You know, it's a, it's an important thing to me. This one's another one that was a journey. Um, yes. And as you can see, I even, I even spelled it wrong on the first round. <laughs> <laughs> The first round was quite an adventure. Um, this one went, I think the timeline was a lot longer. So the time from when I got the initial sort of summary or the content that I was working from to the time where, you know, I think the, the, the sort of marketing stuff happened was longer. Um, so I was kind of working on these a little blinder than I would typically do. I was sort of, you know, trying to trying to work without any kind of input from from the author of the marketing team and you're going to see when i show the actual cover how very different those two results ended up being like this is what i made when i didn't have a lot of direction and when i didn't have a lot of you know um input um and i think in some ways from a design standpoint and just personally these are incredibly successful to me. I mean, I think mm -hmm. I, I'm still finding, I'm still looking for a place to use this flashlight illustration. Like right. I was so pleased with it when it, when it first, when I first finished it. So, and then there will, there will be a time, there will come a time to <laughs> use that. Um, but you know, this was such a great exercise in just sort of free form creative. You take a title and a couple of sentences and what would I make? What can I make? Yeah. Um, so I, these these covers, although they weren't even in the initial round of design, they there's I still have a lot of feelings about them. I still have really strong <laughs> feelings for them. Um, and then, as you can see, this is where we ended up, uh, right. which is dramatically different where I from where I started. Right. <laughs> where I started, um, the author provided this photograph that she had taken. I want to say South Africa. I don't know. I want to say this was a tour of a facility, a prison, some sort of, some other sort of institutional space in South Africa. I'm, I'm like 99% sure of that. Um, and she had taken the original photo, which I don't have in its entirety, but is, is more or less what you're seeing up here on the left. Um, and it was a beautiful shot, but it was very horizontally oriented, which is a challenge when we're talking about a, a vertically oriented book. Um, and it wasn't terribly, there was a lot going on, right? There wasn't, there was, I mean, this, this kind of, this title, Bestiality of the Involved is such a in your face title. It's such a, <laughs> if that is a, what I, if I would tell someone that I was working on this title, they'd be like, oh my God, what is that book about? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I'm like, that's ah, cool. It's not like, yeah. But, um, so I, I was, I, I needed to make the image more complex. I felt the need to make the image more complicated. I felt the need to make the image more sort of powerful. Um, so the flipping and the mirroring of it was a great solution, not only to deal with the whole vertical versus horizontal situation, um, but I think that idea of confusion, 
and mm -hmm. that idea of disorientation and that sort of you know it throws you off it throws you for a loop so rather than being smacked in the face by the title you're sort of smacked in the face by like wait what is what what is happening here is that two different rooms am i like it, it's got that almost like drunk quality to it where you can't yeah. quite figure out what's going on um and i thought that was really important to counter that really the title of it's very very powerful that's very like wow yeah so it worked i think it ended up working it, it was a it was quite a journey to get there um and it looks absolutely nothing like you know right. what where my brain went the first right, time right, right, right. <laughs> yeah the title i tell people you know all i have to do is say this title i don't even need to eat lunch I you know, it's just uh, <laughs> it's just like bestiality of the involved and you're like, you know it's like, well, that's uh, yeah, I, know. I have no idea I love, but, but and that I, was i think what i was doing up here was you know, here I was trying to sort of temper the title a little bit. Mm -hmm. The illustration is obviously a little bit more playful. It's a little bit more um, kind of stylized. So for that one, I was sort of trying to play, like almost almost temper the title a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's called Beast the Audience and the Involved, but it's got these silly letters and, yes. you know, all this stuff. And then the middle one was really just a study in line work and sort of minimalist representation of sort of that savage, you know, nature. And then the right one I thought was a translation on like the invasiveness of uh, modern society into you know nature and into right, the organic right, world. Yeah. So having those hot neon crazy colors layered on top of the, the bird illustration. Um, so, you know, these were a lot more sort of conceptual than, well, I mean, I, they, those were a lot more literal, I think, than this yeah. one, which is highly, highly conceptual. Right, wow. I think that's the last one I have images for. That's that's amazing. I mean, I <laughs> I, I find just taking the bestiality of the of the involved. I mean, you've literally created a doorway into the book. Oh, I double, didn't, you, know, you know, I never thought of it that way. And it and and I'm I'm noticing now and seeing these that that in so many of the cases you're choosing either it's it, you are working in dimensions and it's, you know both this book and museum of stones feel like uh you're looking into the book whereas dear z that's coming right out at you right right you know right. and and it had the surface and and silk road the surface is like okay you know it's it, it, you, so you're, you're either kind of sacramentally moving into the book or the book is erotically coming and grabbing you mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um uh, you know, it, it, but I, I'm just, I, and we all are, you know, I mean, just to, to tell people a little bit about what, you know, how this process plays out. So Lisa will send these versions to the Etruscan team, you know, uh, Bill, Pamela, myself, Bob Mooney, and then we'll weigh in. And those conversations are so insightful and wonderful because we've never... You know, I, I have a line in, in, a, in a poem where we're talking about Homer just, to, you know, inventing the Iliad, inventing the alphabet or discovering the alphabet. And it's like never before had he seen the Iliad. You know, before that, yeah. it was all in his head. And it's yeah. like sometimes with these covers, it's mm -hmm. like never before had we seen bestiality of the involved. You know, we'd read it, but now we're thinking of the whole book in such different mm -hmm. ways. And it's freaky because you have different versions. Yeah. So sometimes somebody will, you know, love one or love another. And, um, uh, but generally speaking, I mean, you know, as I say, those conversations I find very productive. And mm -hmm. then we come back to you and a lot of times the author will be involved and say, well, can we change this or that or the mm -hmm. next thing? And, and so there's the, the versions, but there's also then the tweaking. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think, you know, as authors, I'm sure, I mean, I'm not, I've never authored a book, but... <laughs> Um, I think as authors, I'm sure you have some level in your mind about what your book's going to look like, right? I'm sure you have some level of visualization of it. Um, it might not be complete. It might sort of have that dreamlike quality. When You know how when you dream and you see a person, but they may not have a face? Right. Like, you know, it's a human right. being, but you can't really, there's no discernible right. facial features. And, and I imagine you see, you know, some level of what you want this book to look like. Um, and that's why I see it as such a huge responsibility. That's why I see it as such an important um, aspect of 
understanding that this is not the work that I did not write this book. Mm. Um, I am merely taking the, the piece of art that you created and translating it into another medium for you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a tremendous responsibility. That is a tremendous responsibility because, you know, in some case, in some cases, somebody's first book. Like, right. I want you to love it. I want you to be right. so excited about it. I want you to, you're going to look at this. This is, you know, maybe you'll look at this for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is a piece of art that you made. I, to, for me to like desecrate it in any way would be heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And and I think too you have to think about you know what Etruscan's aesthetic is as well. Right. Um, you know there are publishers like I said you know you can tell an FSG book, you can tell a Knopf book. They don't look identical, but you know that Chip Kid was behind it, and you know what he does and what he what he can do and what he would art direct his team to do. Um, so you know even though these books, all of these books that we looked at today are wildly different from one another. You know, I hope that there's still kind of a commonality or a common thread in the design of them that honors the style that Etruscan has has kind of cultivated over the years. It's certainly, it's, I think that's exactly the way. It, it's, it's a dance among the various people who are contributing. And on the one hand, it's the author's first book, but it's Etruscan's 99th book. Yeah. <laughs> And so there's, you know, we wanted to represent that author, but you're right. We also, you know, we wanted to, to be part of this yeah, part of the broad family of, of mm -hmm. covers that maybe don't, I mean, the, the variety here, of course, would sure. challenge somebody to elucidate a theme, a single theme. Yet, on the, on the other hand, there's something, mm. something vaguely of, <laughs> I, I I think maybe resistance against the literal, yeah, an attempt, absolutely. you know, an attempt to say uh, this this book has more than one mm -hmm. way of looking at it. I mean, Silk Road. You look at the various Silk Roads. So, and that's what you do. And and it's uh, when you say the author has some idea of what it's going to look like. I love I love the idea of saying, well, it's like a dream where you don't see the face. I know that as an author, a lot of times you. Know, I will think about covers and I'll talk about it. I'll say, oh, I'd like it to have this, or I'd like it to be that, but I can never really come, I don't have the vocabulary or the artistic library in my head to be able to say, uh, what, what should it look like? So I stole, you know, this one uh, and, 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 and others, you know, I mean, uh, I have a few artist friends and, and we all, you know, it's just, it's, an, it's such an interesting thing to do. And I tell students too, I say, you know, when you write your book, you should think about the cover. You, your book should have a theme song. Your mm -hmm. book should have a work of art. You sh mm -hmm. You've got to find some way to get off the page and mm -hmm. get into another art form. Mm -hmm. and, and for us, uh, your designs uh, really you know, I mean, I adore spark those. that. Yes, yeah, they, they're, yeah. it's, uh, it's always one of the biggest thrills is, is that, okay, Lisa sent us an email. <laughs> Lisa sent some work over. Let's see, um, let's see what's yeah. gonna happen today. I mean, I, I love, I'm so pleased to work on the types of books that I do, the genre of books that I right. do. Because as you said, I think that the literal interpretations, you know, if we worked on a book about baseball or if we worked on a book about mm -hmm. witches, I don't know. Um, you know, there, I have limitations in that way. There are, mm -hmm. there, I need to represent witchiness. I need to, the, the, someone who wants to read a baseball book has to feel baseball. Um, but when we're, when we're dealing with poetry and we're dealing with short story collections, um, as I said before, you can really key in onto those more abstract concepts. So, you know, feelings of fear or anticipation or excitement or, you know, it, it is, for instance, Silk Road, you know, this feeling of adventure and this feeling of secrecy and intrigue and, and you know, excitement. Um, those to me are so much more freeing to be able to translate because I don't have a preconceived, you know, okay, baseball uses pinstripes and the colors <laughs> red, white, and blue and dirt. And like these are, <laughs> these are sort of textures and colors and things that are automatically assigned to that concept. Um, you know, witches use a lot of black and a lot of right. swirly lettering and, you know, uh, old timey kind of looking baubles and things like that. So I'd be so limited in, right you know, the, what, what my versions of these representations are. And in these 
types of genres and these types of books. I mean, it is, you know, I, the one I can't remember. I wish I still had the summary that you guys sent me for bestiality because this summary, I was, I, I read it and I had to read it like four more times and I'm like, I still don't super understand understand what's going on here but all right we're gonna we're gonna go with it we're gonna, we're gonna see what we can do um because it gets it, it, some of them really get in the weeds as far as like existential you know connections mm -hmm. that they're making and conceptual connections that they're making where i'm like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not uh Sometimes we 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 it's, resist you know, we, we resist all readings altogether. We don't we don't want readers, you know. <laughs> the hoi polloi, you know. No, <laughs> human mean, beings. I ah. I have I have the most incredible bookshelf <laughs> because of the the books that I worked on with you guys and the work that I've done with you folks. I mean, uh, it's some of the some of because I I mean obviously you guys they they generously send me a book once they're completed. Um, and I do read them. I, I, I read them after the fact, actually. Um, and it's definitely brought me a new appreciation for poetry that I didn't have before. Um, just sort of being so intimately involved in the process of creating this piece. Um, I look at it differently. I read it differently. I absorb the content differently. So it's definitely brought in my mind as far as the type of books that I, you know, buy and read because intimately involving me in the process changes the way I perceive it. Lisa Reynolds, thank you so much <laughs> for all you do. You're uh, so we're very looking welcome. forward. Uh, tell us what, now, what is the next project you're working on that we're, we're... So right now I have the, I have, I have your book for Broadstone, right. the, the Elsewhere. And I had, there's another title and I am actually blanking on it well, right Well, you now. worked on Trio, right? Did I worked on, tri oh yes, Trio, Trio's in, Trio's in, in, um, in production, yes, in production, I think, um, and that was a fun one, that was a really exciting one, because it was three different stories by three yes. different authors, that's a lot of content that had to yes. fit on there, um, yes. so that was really, that, that one, I'm excited for that one to come out, and I can't wait for everybody to see it, because it, I think the solution that we ended up using oh, is a really, really gorgeous. cool one. Thank yes. you. I, I, I loved that one. Yes. Um, so that was, the, that was a rare case where the one that I pick also got picked. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, we have a saying in design where it don't have a favorite because that client will pick the other one. Oh, okay. um, and it happens, it, it happens to most people. So, oh. <laughs> so that was the case where I was like, yes, that's the one I was hoping you would pick. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. All right.